Hello, I'm Mark Mattioli, and welcome to another reading of Boston Accent. Boston Accent is available on Amazon.com, and Boston Accent contains adult subject matter. We're going to pick up where we left off yesterday. Without further ado, let's get into it. As we approach Salt Lake City, Utah, which will be our final change of buses. The four of us are scrambling around exchanging addresses and phone numbers so we can keep in touch. On, the, on our last leg of our trip, Mike and I will be on the same bus. Steve will board a different bus to Southern California and Lonnie will be on a different bus to Oregon. As it turned out, Lonnie sent me a package my first month in Sacramento the long letter telling me she had really fallen for me in the short time she had known me and hoped I would think of her from time to time. Included in the package was an erotic book called Now Molly Knows about a teenage girl losing her innocence. It was pretty bizarre, but all these years later, I have not forgotten her, and I went as far as naming my first dog Molly. I made no effort to contact Steve or Mike, nor they me. When I finally arrived at the bus terminal in Sacramento, Phil was waiting for me. Phil had some good news and some bad news for me. At 22, he'd finally lost his virginity to a hairdresser in the, rel in the reclining chair in the salon after hours. I was very happy for him that he'd finally lost his cherry, and I asked him, so what's the bad news? He tells me that the hairdresser gave him Herpes, which he's going to have for the rest of his life. I began to preach to him, as I had done since we were eight years old, but Phil is stubborn as a mule. We arrive at the house he's living in, and it turns out to be a predominantly Mexican-American neighborhood, with Phil and I being the only whites and two families that are black. I will soon find out that these demographics are important, and we are not welcome here. The very modest single-family house on a just as modest piece of land is surrounded by a, rust, a rusted chain link fence as are the adjoining properties and the homes across the street. There is a small single car garage at the end of the driveway in serious need of repair. As we enter the house I hear dogs barking as they rush to greet us followed by their owner Inez, a Mexican-American woman 24 years old. Inez goes to school during the day and works at night, the same as Phil. She seems very friendly, and she shows me where I'll be staying, on an enclosed porch at the back of the house, right off the kitchen. The porch is only a narrow strip containing a sofa bed that takes up pretty much the entire porch. There is just enough room to close the inside porch door to give you privacy from the kitchen. There is no room for a dresser or a nightstand or furniture of any kind. For the next three months, I will be living out of my suitcase. The very next night, Inez tells me she has the night off from work and, I would, and, would, and would like to take me out to dinner so she can get to know me better. We end up in an area of the city known as Old Sacramento, which is like an old west town with wooden board walks and saloons. Inez chooses a casual restaurant and we have a nice dinner. We are both drinking a lot and having a great time with a lot of laughter. I had noticed that the day I met Inez that she wasn't exactly feminine, but I didn't give it that much thought. She was only the second Mexican I had, I had met. I thought maybe they were all kind of squat and not too pretty. At the end of dinner, I just finished telling Inez a story, and she was laughing. We were both very buzzed, and there was a moment between us when well, we just looked into each other's eyes, followed by silence, and Mr. Spontaneity, Mr. Spontaneity, Spontaneity, this is like linoleum, Mr. S I, I wrote this and I can't read it, Mr. Spontaneity, <laughs> I, uh, yeah, Mr. Spontaneity leaned over the table and gave her a kiss. I looked at it as thanking the woman who was letting me crash on her porch till I could get on my own feet. I was willing to trade sex for a roof over my head, considering I didn't have much money. Inez's reaction to the kiss was not what I expected. Her only 
instinctive response was to say, don't do that. I apologized and explained that I must have misread her signals. She wanted to leave after that and pulled Phil aside and told him what had happened as soon as, as, soon as he got home. Phil came barging into my luxurious porch suite and began to rant and rave about what could I possibly have been thinking? I didn't get it. I told him I told him that, which only made him matter. I gave her a quick peck on the mouth. No tongue. What is she, a nun? I could tell by Phil's reaction that he had underlying feelings for Inez, whether she was a lesbian or not. How dare I kiss his roommate or some crap? Phil quoted Inez as calling me an egotistical jerk and God's gift to women. I had been there 24 hours. This wasn't a good sign. I decided I needed to get out of there, so I called Kevin in Oakland, which is 100 miles away. Kevin tells me he has to work in the morning, but if I take a bus, he will meet me at the terminal at the end of his shift. I keep a low profile the next morning and stay on the porch, waiting for Inez and Phil to leave, and then I gather up two days of clothing, put them in a bag, and hoof it to the bus station. As I walk through the neighborhood, I feel like I'm in a different world, and I quickly quickly learn that I'm deep in the middle of what ref I'm deep in the middle of what ref Phil refers to as Chicano Central. I soon begin to call it the Barrio, or Mexican Slum, and then finally Sacraghetto. On my way to the bus, I see my first lowriders, which are chopped Chevrolets with custom hydraulics. They make the cars go up and down. I could appreciate the time, effort, and money that went into these cars. What I didn't appreciate was the Spanish insults they shouted at me as I walked. I made it to the terminal and had a quick 90-minute ride to Oakland. As I got off the bus and looked around for Kevin, I came face to face with my first Hells Angel. He was leaning on his bike, waiting for someone to arrive. After 30 minutes or so, Kevin pulled in, driving a rental car, He had, as he had not yet bought a car. He then took me on a tour of Oakland, not only famous for Hells Angels, but also the Black Panthers. Our first stop was the Oakland Coliseum, home to the Oakland Ra Raiders. Kevin slowed down enough for me to hang out the window and take a picture. We did not actually stop. Oakland, it turned out, is a very industrial area, and there was not a whole lot to see, so we bought beer and headed on to Kevin's apartment. Kevin pulls into a parking lot with a large warehouse in front of us and shuts off the car. What's this, I ask him. He replies, where I live. I just sit there with my mouth open, looking back and forth from Kevin with a big grin on his face to this run-down, shitty-looking building. Kevin tells me to follow him in follow him and we head inside uh, Luca Luca wants to participate in this so oh, we're gonna bring Luca up here and he's gonna help us read okay while walking Kevin tells me this building is called a space or more specifically the individual apartments in, inside the warehouse are called a space a landlord buys a large open warehouse and sells space inside the building by the square foot once a buyer and landlord have an agreement, the landlord marks off an area inside the building, which is the buyer's space. The landlord has already studied a hallway throughout the building. It's up to the buyer to study the interior walls and create an apartment of his own design subject to current city codes and the passing of inspection. I thought it was one of the most bizarre sites I had ever seen, but at the same time, it was an amazing concept. Once inside Kevin's space, it just got even crazier. The original design was a creation by Kevin's sister's boyfriend, Luke. And the first thing I noticed when I entered was how good it smelled inside, like cedar. The entire apartment was all natural wood with nothing painted. The apartment had a high cathedral ceiling due to the location in the warehouse. It was 35 feet from the ground to the warehouse ceiling, and the buyer could utilize the entire 35 feet if he chose by building a second floor inside his space. Luke hadn't built a second floor, per se, but he had installed two large loft areas. I'm going to turn the page, Luca. This is Luca, by the way, everyone. This is Luca. Say hi, Luca. Hi. Dad, I'm bored. Dad, play with me, Dad. Okay, we're almost done, Luca. We're almost done. 
Kevin slept in one loft, and a co-worker of Luke's slept in the other. The whole downstairs was open floor, was open floor plan housing the large kitchen and large living room. Off the living room was a massive master bedroom with his and hers walking closet, and a huge bathroom off the kitchen was my favorite room. The bath, as well as much of the apartment, had cedar shingles on the wall, which when you added hot steam from the shower, you got the great cedar aroma that not only fills the bathroom but drifts out into the main living area. The shower itself was totally open with no doors or curtains and just had a lip you stepped over to enter. In addition to the walls being lined with cedar, the large shower had two shower heads, one at each end, so two people could shower together and not have to jockey for position. What a concept. I loved it. We spent one night at the space, and the next day we headed back to Sacramento. On the ride, Kevin tells me a horror story of his first week at Oakland. It seems he had just rented his car. It was out driving when he got pulled over by the cops for some traffic violation. The cops ran a check on him and found he still had warrants in Massachusetts that he had not cleared up, and they arrested him. Bail was set, but didn't have his sister's phone number mesmerized. You're mesmerized. I'm mesmerized. Are, are you mesmerized? Memorized. And he didn't have it on him. Kevin found himself in a holding cell with 15 black guys in the Oakland County Jail with no one to call. Oh, you good boy. Oh, thank you. When his sister noticed she hadn't seen him for a couple of days, she figured he must have gotten lucky and shocked up with a young woman. Then on day four... She began to get nervous and started looking for him, starting with hospitals and then lockups. Kevin said it will for forever be one of the happiest moments of his life when late on day four of his incarceration, a cop appeared at the cage, called his name and said, your bail's been paid. Okay, we don't have time to start another segment because it's, it's going to get long and crazy from here on. I know what's coming. Yeah, so we want we're gonna want to start that afresh, and uh, um, I think Luca has to has to go outside to pee pee time. All right, I'm Mark Mattioli. We're reading Boston Accent, which is available on Amazon.com, and uh, God willing, we'll do this again tomorrow. Ciao.